All right, and so we just wanna say welcome everybody. My name is Christina and I'm with Atlantic Institute. And we are very privileged to, today for our highlight event for our tour of faiths in the month of July. We um, have been able to be connected to Ami in Jerusalem for him to give us a virtual tour of um, all of the important things that we'd wanna see if we actually were there. And I'm sure if we actually ever get to go, he would love to help you take a look. And so I'll Absolutely. go ahead and turn this over. Let me, let me spotlight you, um, if that helps. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And in the middle, I'll share a screen. So Todah Rabbi, as we say in Hebrew, thank you very much, Christina. And to Rabbi uh, Matthew Marco, who's not with us today, uh, I appreciate the opportunity of giving me. I'll introduce myself briefly. My name is Ami, and as you can tell from my American accent, I was not born in Israel. I was born in Chicago, but I, I moved to Israel, as we say, made Aliyah to Israel when I was a little kid. I was five years old. So I've really been here my whole life. I live in Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is, uh, as I said to Christina before, it's not just about the holy places. It's, it's, it's actually a city where, you know, you have life and, and all the different aspects that that entails. I've been involved in guiding and in informal education for the last over 20 years, and I've been a licensed tour guide uh, for the last 13 years. Um, what I'm going to do now is let, a, let us share screen. And here we go. And I'm going to put this just on my face so now I can only see myself. And, and as Christina was saying before, look, what we're going to do is like this. We are, I'm going to run through uh, the tour, which will take hour plus, however long it takes. I know many times in the middle, people have questions. And, but because we're, you know, going on 20 people, I don't know, maybe more will join. Sometimes they get into rhythm. I'll say, I'll, I'll take a break in the middle for questions and also at the end. Now, I don't want you to forget your questions. So my suggestion, if you have a question, you're nervous, you'll forget it. And I'm not stopping right then. Write it in the chat, okay? And that way you can remember it or I can read it or whatnot. And when we take a break in the middle or then again um, at the end, I think. And with that, we can we can get started. Let's let's get going. Um, so I'll say uh, welcome to Jerusalem. Welcome to Jerusalem. We have uh, years ago, I came to the United States to visit. Um, and I was standing in Times Square in Manhattan. And I was convinced. I was sure. I was standing in the center of the world, but I was wrong. I was not. The center of the world is Jerusalem. And why am I saying that? I'm saying this because in Jerusalem, we have the three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, not sitting side by side, but literally one on top of the other. And we're going to explore um, various sites in, in and around the old city of Jerusalem in order to um, experience that. And we're talking about 2.4 billion Christian eyes looking towards Jerusalem, 1.7 billion Muslim eyes looking towards Jerusalem, 14 million Jewish eyes looking towards Jerusalem. And why is that? The answer is in some of the sites that we're going to visit today. What we're going to do um, is like this. Let me move my little space bar over here. Um, and it, first of all, we, what we can see... Before this is you the old start city. for a second, I mean, yeah. can I ask you something? Do you know, um, one of the ladies was asking if there was any um, closed captioning on Zoom. Did you? What does closed captioning mean? It's when they put words at the bottom, like what you're saying is translated into words across the bottom. So I've never heard of that. No, I have not. Heard of it? Okay. No. I just wanted to I, ask it. Now, if you, I was going to look and see while you're, you're speaking. If, if you know how to put that up, that sounds great. I I, it out. Sorry, I, I, I don't know okay. something like that. Okay. Um, what? Well, but if if I'm talking too fast, stop me. All right, I have a tendency to talk too fast. You are more than welcome to interrupt me in the middle to say, Ami, slow down. And if there's too much background noise, also please stop me to tell me there's too much background noise because I'm sitting by an open window with cars passing by outside. Um, you can hear it finally on the other side of the fun, on the other side of the world better than me because I have the headset on and I right. will move if it's an issue. Okay, don't okay. don't feel bad to stop me. Look, the old city, we're looking at it right now with this red uh, dot. I'm going to run around the walls of the old city, and this is where we're going to be walking around most of the time today. Okay, within the old city, which size is a third of a square mile. Inside of the old city, what we're going to do is we're going to go and visit the three religions. We're going to visit the Western Wall and the Western Wall Tunnels. In Judaism, we're going to visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Christianity, and a little bit of the Via Dolorosa and um, Haram el Sharif with the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, in addition to that, we're going to cheat a little bit. And before we go into the old city, we're going to go to this area the ancient city of David, all right, where it all begins in Jerusalem in the very beginnings. We're going to start from there chronologically, and then we're chronologically going to come up 
to the temple, Mount with the temple, the Western Wall, and then the Church of the Sepulchre with the Via de la Rosa, and then back to Haram el Sharif with the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. And if we're talking about an interfaith tour and how the different faiths connect over here in Jerusalem, I would like to read three quotes to you from the three different religions throughout history um, regarding the connection and the passion towards Jerusalem. In Judaism, all right, there's a quote that describes Jerusalem and its beauty. It says, 10 measures of beauty descended upon the world. Nine were given to Jerusalem and one to the rest of the world. In Christianity, there will be a beautiful quote that says, as Judea, Jerusalem is located in a geographical area called Judea. As Judea is exalted above all other provinces, so is the city exalted above all Judea. And in Islam, uh, the quote, there are many, many quotes, but the one quote that I'll give over here with the connection will be, one day in Jerusalem is like a thousand days, one month like a thousand months, and one year like a thousand years. Dying there is like dying in the first sphere of heaven. With that, like you can almost stop the tour because it's like, wow, amazing. We're not going to stop over there. We're going to jump in now. And we said we're going to start um, at the very, very beginnings. If we move everything here away and we walk around in Jerusalem, okay, let's say about 4,000 years ago, we'll see mostly barren land, hills and valleys and hills and valleys. And it'll be over there. And we're going to go chronologically through the religions. We're going to start with Judaism and then Christianity, then Islam. Um, but 4,000 years ago, Okay, according to the Jewish belief, or even more, let's go back to almost 6,000 years ago, according to Jewish belief, this hill over here, which is called Mount Moriah, this is the place of creation, the place of beginnings. According to Judaism, 5,781 years ago, Mount Moriah is where it's going to begin from. Begin from the quote is from the Talmud, Jewish sources written 1,500 years ago, saying these are the beginnings and this is the center of the world. By the way, we're going to make a lot of connections with the three religions we're talking about today. And this is going to be a motif, center of the world, beginnings, all right? This is going to touch upon all religions, which is, in my opinion, absolutely fascinating. The story of the binding of Isaac in Judaism is going to take place over here on Mount Moriah, later the binding of Ishmael, okay, by Abraham, according to the Muslim belief. But what we're going to do now, if we're going to jump past the beginnings with the place of the center of the world or the place of creation, according to Judaism and the binding of Isaac, according to Judaism, let's now jump forward to about 3,000 years ago. And 3,000 years ago, we're going to land um, in ancient Ur Salum. It sounds like Jerusalem, where the Jebusites are going to be located. The Jebusites are an ancient Canaanite people. Where are we located right now? We're actually located right outside the old city. Okay, if this is the old city, a third of a square mile, the area of Jerusalem where it begins, the oldest areas are so old, they're outside the walls of the old city, right south of it in this little area over here, which today um, we will call uh, the city of David. Uh, I'm not getting into politics. I know there's a lot of politics over here. Also Silwan, East Jerusalem. I'm staying very far away from that. But I'm gonna go into the historical site with your permission of uh, the city of David. And it's in this little area over here. We're just running along here with my red, you know, beam over here. It's in this little area over here, which size is 11 acres. Zeru, as we say in Hebrew, that is all that the Jebusites will be located. And according to the, the, the biblical text, the Old Testament I'm talking about over here, King David is going to arrive to here about 3,000 years ago, and he is going to conquer Jerusalem. Oops. Conquer Jerusalem over here from from the Jebusites. Now, there's a tremendous amount of archaeology, and let's go visit what is maybe, and I'm careful with my words, you have to be very careful in archaeology, let's go visit what is maybe David's palace over here. In order to do that, let's really bring it to life and jump into Google Earth. Okay, we're moving around. Always makes it fun. It makes it feel like we're really over here. Okay, where exactly did we jump over to over here? Let's twist and turn 360 degrees to give us a bit of a feel. Okay, before I start explaining what these stones are, where are we located exactly? To answer that question, let's go back to our map of the city of David and come to here. All right, this is theory of what ancient Ulsalum, ancient Jerusalem looked like 3,000 years ago when King David, the Jewish king, will conquer it, will capture it. And he's going to come to over here. He's going to build his palace over here. And later his son Solomon, Shlomo, will build the first temple atop Mount Moriah and the temple mount on top of this hill um, over here. But let's now actually come and land inside 
The area of what is maybe David's palace, okay? So let's go back to Google Earth, and we've landed over here. And you'll be standing over here, okay? And we're going to be looking at these stones, and you may say to me, Ami, that looks like a pile of stones. How do you know that that's 3,000 years old? And what gives you the audacity to say that that might be David's palace? And first of all, I always use the word maybe. We're very careful over here. But let's take a look. First of all, when we're looking at these stones over here, and it's easier to see when we're really standing over there, but this is the best we can do right now. We see that this is a long wall that's going from west on one end over here in the direction of east, okay, out in this direction. And over here, this is where the wall will connect to the next wall, which is running on a north-south axis. I'm pointing out these walls over here because these are walls that are built by large stones. They're long, okay, long walls. This wall from east to west will be about 100 feet long. And there's another big perpendicular wall over here that's going also north-south. You don't need to remember the north-south. So the idea is, is these are big, powerful walls built by large stones. Professionals needed to have built this over here. It was built by a monarchy. And we'll still be asking, so how do we know it's dated to 3,000 years ago, 10th century BC? Because of the pottery that was found inside of it over here, archaeologists know how to date pottery to different eras over here. King David was a figure who walks around here 3,000 years ago. Did he live in this palace over here? Was it built a little bit after his time? Is a hard question to answer. But we're standing over here inside of a building built by the monarchy of the tribe of Judea over here. 3,000 years ago, when Jerusalem will become the Jewish capital for the first time as part of the tribe of Judah and the other tribes around it at that point. But the history over here is absolutely incredible. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to walk down these steps over here. We're going to start walking. Okay, here's one step. Usually I jump straight down, but you know what? If we can walk this just to make it fun, uh, let's do that. We're making our way down these steps. And my destination is to come down. Let's take another few steps, a few, a few more steps down here. And we want to get to the bottom of the steps. Let's just jump over here. Oops, a little bit. Let's go a little bit more. And one more step, and here we go. Now let's turn around. We were just standing on top over here, okay, underneath this area, this shaded area. But now we're looking at this wall over here, which really tells us the history of Jerusalem over about a 500-year period. Um, let's join in. Let's start walking around over here. We're walking around what's called First Temple Air in Jerusalem. King David has passed away, but there will be a Jewish monarchy over here for the next 500 years until the First Temple will be destroyed 2,600 years ago. Maybe we're going to come after a long walk and we're going to want to sit with her a cup of coffee inside this home over here. We can see these columns sticking up. This is part of what's called a four-roomed home. We'll sit over here, a very fancy home back then. And who does it belong to is a good question. They found a piece of pottery with the name Achi Elane. Does it belong to this person? For argument's sake, let's say yes. We'll sit with Achi We'll have a cup of coffee. We'll look out the window and what are we going to see? Well, we'll look down in between these stones over here. And we're going to see a lot of action going on over there 26 and 2700 years ago. And why is that? Because this is the area of the main archive. Now, we know this because there are a lot of bulot, clay seals that were found that used to stamp letters with in ancient times. And there's names on the clay seals, names of different figures that we know from the Old Testament, like Mariao ben Shafan, for example, who... Have you heard of him? I assume you have. He was a very well-known figure. 2,600 years ago, you would have heard of him. Don't worry about it if you haven't heard of him in the year 2021. But he was the head scribe of the area over here. We'll also turn our camera a little bit more. And what we can see over here is a toilet. Now, I'm telling you these things to try and create this feeling of what's going on 2,600 years ago, where we can almost eat, feel, and smell what was going on um, in, at this time. Now, this toilet over here was examined uh, by forensics and they found the remains of what people ate. And they discovered that people ate back then mallow weed that was growing in the ground. Why would they be eating mallow weed that's growing in the ground? Because historically, if we're talking about what's going on 2,600 years ago, Jerusalem is under siege by the Babylonians who eventually will conquer Jerusalem and destroy the first temple. So you've run out of food really and you're eating mallow weed at that time that's growing out of the grounds over here. And they also found spearheads in layers of ashes dating back to this time of destruction. And the first temple will be destroyed 2,600 years ago. 
Um, it'll take a few dozen years, but the Jews will get permission to return to Jerusalem from Cyrus, king of Persia. And when returning, they'll rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that we can see the remains of that on this top area of this wall over here, okay? Which will leapfrog us now to our next topic and our next site. Usually we spend in the city of David about three hours. We just spent, I think, about 10, 12 minutes because we're really trying to cover, you know, from a bird's eye view, the different uh, sites of the different, the different key sites of the different monotheistic religions. So what we're going to do now with your permission is we're going to leave the city of David, okay? And now what we're going to do is, is let's go back to our PowerPoint presentation. And we're going to now come up to the Temple Mount. When I talk about Judaism in the Temple, I talk about the Temple Mount. When you talk about Islam later on, we're going to talk about Haram al-Sharif. All right. And it, as we come up to the Second Temple, okay, the Second Temple existed for roughly 600 years from about the 6th century before the Common Era, about 2,500 years ago until its destruction in the year 70 of the Common Era by the Romans. But a lot can happen over a 600-year period. In just a second, I'm just going to take a quick drink. And what we're going to do is we're going to jump now to the main era, main era. There are a lot of main eras, but if we want to talk, let's say maybe say the most talked about era um, and, and, and the most built up era of Second Temple era, and that's towards the end, 2000 years ago, the Romans are ruling over here and they'll take a man named Herod and make him king. And what Herod is going to do is he's going to build, when we look today, at this structure over here, this massive square structure that's called the Temple Mount or Haram al-Sharif, depending what religion you come from, it's a structure that sizes about 37, 38 acres. And dunam that we use in Israel, it's 144 dunam. It's absolutely huge, all right? The western and eastern retaining walls are about 1,500 feet long, all right? The southern and then the northern walls are about 1,000 feet long. And it's, it's gigantic, and it was built at least originally, of course, fixed up many times over since then, but originally by King Herod. And what was on top of it 2,000 years ago, what was on top of it 2,000 years ago, was this, was the second was the second temple. Now, when you go today in Israel to the, uh, to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, there's a massive model that was designed by a, a professor named Michaela Viona back in the 1960s. And it, what we see, and the, the idea is it shows Jerusalem Second Temple Jerusalem from the year 66 of the Common Era, right before the Second Temple was destroyed. We're not going to talk about Jerusalem over here today. We're going to talk about the Temple Mount and specifically the Second Temple um, that we can see over here. And how do we know that this is what, the, how did Michal Avionai, so many people today know what the Temple Mount and the Temple looked like in ancient Jerusalem looked like? It, 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 there's an endless amount um, of history that tells us this. First of all, writings such as Josephus Flavius, uh, Yosef and Matityahu, um, the historian, the Jewish historian who will live 2,000 years ago when the Second Temple was destroyed, and he'll write about, he'll describe in detail in his book, War of the Jews and, and, and History of the Jews, that you can read today, endless amounts of archaeology. Other Roman historians also, such as Pliny the Elders, one or Philo from Alexandria, or others. The New Testament, of course, also is going to describe Jerusalem and the temple a tremendous amount. Of, and so we can get, not to mention the Jewish sources are written a little later, such as the Mishnah and the Talmud. So we get a, um, a very good description of what the temple looked like back then. And if we're walking over here um, 2,000 years ago, we're going to walk in from the southern end. I'm sure we'll be very excited. This is probably something we've been waiting for um, our whole life. And by the way, Jews and non-Jews alike, the descriptions are everybody came up to over here to this wondrous building. And we'll come in from the southern end. There are doors that we can't see from this angle and we'll come up steps over here and we'll walk along the Temple Mount over here. We can also meet Jesus, by the way, along the way. And as he's over here in the Royal Basilica, we're throwing the tables of the money changers or maybe he's being forgotten over here as a young child when he comes with his parents over here, um, Analia La Regel. Uh, to visit during the, the, the holidays, to visit the temple. And we're walking along and we'll come in, and this is the temple itself. We'll make our way inside, sacrifices basically by the priests that represent everybody over here. And then we'll make, oops, and then we'll continue walking around from the northern end and out from the western side. This was the circular route um, that was done. So that is, uh, that's the temple itself. And to get a bit of a more of a, a, um, of a feeling, and let me show you one more picture before we land there and sort of start twisting and turning. 
This is another angle of it from what it looked like 2,000 years ago. If in this picture over here, we're looking from the eastern side to the west, let's flip, okay? And now we're looking from the western side towards the eastern side. Um, this is the western wall, okay? Also known as the Wailing Wall, the Kotel. It's all the same thing, different words for the same wall. The This wall, this is the western retaining wall of the Temple Mount built by King Herod. This is the southern wall, the eastern wall, and the northern wall, okay? And, and here, of course, is the back area of the temple before we were looking at more of the, more of the front area. And today, when uh, we come and visit uh, Israel and come to the old city, um, one of the places that are most visited uh, by, by pretty much all religions will be the Kotel, will be the Western Wall. Um, but you're not going to necess necessarily visit the entire wall, or at least not at once. There's a classic area that's over here. And in a minute, we'll land there with Google Street View and twist around a little bit. But this is this picture is important to get really an understanding of it. And, and we get to see this area over here. The area of the wall that we visit today is only an eighth in length of the entire length of the Western Wall. OK, this area is 200 feet long, meaning that the whole thing over here is about 1,500 um, feet long. And now what I, what I want to do is I want us to land at the southern end of the Western Wall. And we're going to land after that on these steps over here of the southern wall. And then we'll go for a very, very quick tour of the Western Wall Tunnels. Um, in order to do that, uh, let's go to here. Here we go. Okay, we've just landed now on the southern end of the Western Wall. Okay, um, the Western Wall is beyond that direction over there. And basically what we're doing, what we're standing over here is we can see the southern corner, the southwestern corner of the Temple Mount. We can see the pavement stones that people walked on 2,000 years ago. This is all original. This was a marketplace. You came to visit Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. You didn't come to the Western Wall to connect, to pray, to take pictures. It was a shuk, all right? It was a marketplace. And you'd walk on these pavement stones where, where our ancestors walked 2,000 years ago. Um, we can see where they shopped, all right? Here are the, here are the or, original, found as is, all right? Nothing uh, remade since then. The entrance doors to the marketplace where we'd come to, um, as we come to visit Jerusalem, we can see these pile of stones over here, that this is part of the destruction from the Romans 2000 years ago. The stones have not been moved from there over the last 2000 years. And here we see remains of stores from the marketplace that were destroyed with the destruction in the year 70 of the common era. But now what I wanna do is, is I wanna flip to the other side. A, let's go. Now we're standing at the Southern Wall. We just went from the Western Wall to the Southern Wall. And this is the side that we would actually enter from. Remember when we were looking at the model before um, of the Second Temple, we said um, that we would enter from the Southern side. Um, so this is the Southern side that we're standing on right now. And now we can see steps that we'd walk up or walk down from. Now you might be looking at these steps and say, well, they don't look like they're, some of them don't look like they're in the best shape. And it's because some of them aren't. Whatever is not in the best shape is because they're original from 2000 years ago, like the steps over here on the bottom. But then we have other steps that are in much better shape over here that of course have been fixed up since then. Um, what I can also tell you that's a little hard to see from here, but I'll tell you is, is that the steps are built in a way, here maybe in, with this picture, we can see a little bit better. Take a look. These steps have been fixed up, most of them. They're narrow and wide and narrow and wide. And why, why is it like that? Why are they narrow and wide, narrow and wide? So when I used to guide youth here in Israel, um, I would always, I'd sit them on the steps and you have to activate them. If I would just talk and talk, they, <laughs> they wouldn't listen. Either when I was, I was a kid. So, you know, I can't complain. But anyways, I said, listen, who's the fastest kid in class? And of course, you know, if one kid, four kids raise their hands. They're all convinced that they're the fastest kids in class. I said, I want you to race up the steps and race down. And they would, and they'd come back exhausted. And I'd say, what's the problem? And they'd say, the steps are so uncomfortable. They're wide and narrow and wide and narrow. And I say, that's the whole idea. Because we're coming up to or leaving from a holy place. So when they were built, they were built in that kind of style, wide and narrow, wide and narrow. So physically, it'll say to you, slow down. You're, you're coming to a holy place. You have to walk up in peace and, you know, calmly and walk down from there in peace and calmly. And as we're looking also over here, I want you to take a look. What we can see is, is the remain over here. And I'm pointing to uh, the, one of the two exit um, exit gates that people would walk out from the temple. 
Um, you can see it's been filled in over the years. Early Muslim era, eras, late Muslim eras have had a tremendous impact, of course, on the Temple Mount, later known as Haram al-Sharif. Um, but I can tell you that this little ledge that I'm pointing out right now with my blue pointer, that is the original top dating to 2,000 years ago, that if we were walking out of the Temple then, that would actually be above our heads as we make our way out. Um, I want you please to remember in the back of your minds this little section over here and sort of the shape of this door over here, okay? I can also tell you, it's hard to see from this angle, but out in this direction over here, there's the remains of the triple doored entrance that people used to walk through. This over here was, um, was the exit. Um, but now let's go back to our PowerPoint and let's take, let's go back to over here. Um, when we come to Jerusalem, uh, we'll come many times and visit the Western Wall Plaza. Here, let's put on the red beam. It's over here. I did this red circle over here to so, sort of show you where the Western Wall area that we all visit is. Again, we can see how small it is. It's only an eighth in length of the entire Western Wall. And what we, we can also do many times, we can go inside what's called the Western Wall Tunnels that will run underneath the Muslim Quarter. This is all the Muslim Quarter over here. It'll run underneath the Muslim Quarter adjacent to the Western Wall. And that's why I put this red arrow over here, okay? And what I wanna do is, is we're gonna do a very quick tour inside. We can spend over an hour inside, even more than that. But we're gonna do five minutes inside because what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk in from over here and then walk along to this spot that is the area of the Western Wall that is right across from what we see today, the Dome of the Rock, but from where 2000 years ago, the, the, the second temple used to stand, okay? We're gonna be standing over here across from the actual temple area itself. So let's go back, you know, let's uh, go um, back to Google Earth and let's move my space bar and let's open this up over here. And, and now what I wanna do is, is we're gonna go to the top. Let's first of all land on the Western Wall. Are you the Western Wall? Okay, not just a picture of it, but to literally stand there. And it's, ooh, it's, a, it's hot in Israel, it's been a heck of a walk. I need a drink. Let's do like that. And here we are, we're now standing at the Western Wall. Uh, we can see the original, at least the bottom rows are the original 2000 year old stones. The top rows are from different eras, early and late Muslim. You can see the Kotel or Western Wall or Wailing Wall Plaza. We twist and turn. We have the, Mus the Jewish quarter in front of us over here and we the Muslim quarter further on in this direction over here. Um, and what we'll do now though, is let's quickly pop over to these arches over here and enter them and visit the Western Wall tunnels. So to do that, we're gonna pop out, gotta go all the way up to the air just to walk like 30 feet. And we're gonna land, here we go. And let's go inside, a uh, very quick tour. And we're gonna make our way in. And as we're walking along, we're walking, these tunnels were actually um, excavated um, after the Six Day War, after 1967. Um, over there, filled up with earth and dirt, and they were excavated over a period of a couple of decades. No one ever lived over here. These arches were mostly built in the Mameluk era. Okay, Mameluks were devout Muslims who arrived in Jerusalem in the Middle Ages. We're talking about 13th, 14th century, seven, 700 ish years ago. And they will build these arches that are above our heads right now as the base to their homes of the Muslim quarter. And now we fit the stones. These are the stones of the Western world, the original 2000 year old stones that are underneath these arches, okay? It's a continuation simply of what's outside, inside. It's that red arrow that I showed you before. And we're gonna walk along it to this spot over here. And this spot over here, we see these, women's, these women praying inside over here. They're actually located, this area that I'm pointing to right now, and, and where they're located, this is in a direct line, only uh, uh, 300 feet away from the place of the foundation stone that we saw in that picture at the very beginning the place of the uh, temples, the first and second temples in the, in the past. Um, and instead of them, the holiest room to Judaism inside of the temples, and that is the Holy of Holies, which is why you will see many people, mostly Jewish usually, coming into here um, in, order, um, in order to pray. And we can see that over here. And for some reason, there's always this piece of toilet paper over here that's stuck over here that makes me, <laughs> that makes me smile. Um, and now what we're gonna do is though, is we've spoken about the city of David, the origins, the beginnings of Jerusalem. We've come to the Western Wall, to really one of the um, holiest places uh, to Judaism, which also connect to the temple. And now uh, we're gonna leave 
Judaism, and we're going to walk, although everything is connected, and we're going to make this connection soon enough, and we're going to take a short walk, um, not very far, and we're going to actually land right over here at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Okay, we're going to walk um, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, a few hundred feet, and, and we're going to go to um, one of the most important sites to Christianity uh, in the world. And, but I'm going to take a break because I promise you to take a break in the middle and I'm going to stop for questions, call it halftime uh, before we continue. And we'll also use Google Earth and videos in order to explore the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So I'm going to stop share and open it to you guys. Let's take a look at the chat. If you have any questions, uh, yes, I can speak more slowly. I will try. That was from a while ago. But you, oh. I think you've done a good job. Whoops. I'm sorry. But that was from I a while ago. Yeah. So, so um, again, I, I encourage you to please um, to please tell me to slow down because I know it's an issue by me. Mm. I think I think it's interesting to note like the weather there is very sunny. I mean, I'm looking at like, you know, every I think it's very interesting that Global Earth has all these images inside. Google Google Earth is is amazing. Um, it's it's really it's really unbelievable. You can do a lot of things with Google Earth, but you cannot do everything. Um, you can land uh, with Street View and walk along some areas. In other areas, you can twist 360, but not more than that. Right. And some areas you cannot quite get to. Um, it, it depends, but it's been extremely helpful in creating virtual tours. Yeah, I mean, I've done Street View here and, and things in the past when I've done it for work years ago done different things but the fact that we were actually able to go inside and see some of those some of yeah. what you were showing us i thought was fascinating that somebody yeah. actually did inside yeah yeah definitely you know? um, definitely that is that is very awesome does anybody have any questions um besides also my, my one thought was that when i was in turkey and we were in urfa looking at the ruins of um these very very old the old ruins over there um Gosh, Goblaki Tempe. Um, that's what it was. It was so hot and it was so dry. And I just remember when you were showing the pictures of the walls and I was, and your stuff is so heavy. People don't think they don't sometimes you don't grasp it till you're standing there. When you were showing how the boulder of the stuff in the ground that fell and had spin there, it's, it's so heavy and it's so it's just, you know. Well, th those are from earlier eras. If we look at the, the Romans, which come a little bit later, and the massive buildings that they created, um, their architecture is unbelievable. There's an architect, uh, a Roman architect from that era by the name of Vitruvius, who writes uh, a, a book in which he describes. It's a, it's, a, it's a short book. It's a technical book. It, she describes the techniques of you know the cranes and how they lifted and how they moved. Um, and it's unbelievable how, how they managed to do these things. Uh, but yeah. They, they did. Yeah. And, I, and also in Israel, it's extraordinarily hot. I don't know. I haven't been to Turkey. I don't know if it's hot as there, but the summer in Israel is brutal. Well, and I can get that it's hot. And I'm, I'm kind of like enjoying the fact that I get to sit in my air conditioning. Yeah, there, there are advantages. Do this. It's so. kind of, it is kind of nice. Yes. And then also I can add that you can fit a week of guiding into, you could do a theme and then, you know, cover several sets to take a week. Otherwise, and here you put it into an hour, an hour and a half. You know, talking about hot, to open my window a little bit more, give me one second and I'm going to be back. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking there might not be air conditioning over there as well. <laughs> and Christina, can you hear me? This is Chaudhry. I can, how are you? Fine, thank you. There's a, I have a quick comment and a question uh, yeah. for our friend. Um, the comment is the church that where you just, uh, they did the break. Uh, Omar, the second caliph, came over to uh, sort of negotiate with the Sephardites, uh, and uh, they uh, concluded a treaty called the Umariya Treaty, the convention, Umar, Umariya Convention. So the bottom line is why they were still there while Umar, uh, uh, the caliph was still inside the church, it was Muslim prayer time, and the, uh, uh, the host invited him to pray there. He took a pause, he did not pray there. He said, I do not want to make a precedent so that you know people start praying and god forbid you know uh, that you know that, that the the, uh, the the church may become a sort of converted into mosque or something so he went outside and i would request you outside and prayed in the space outside which is now the mosque of omar 
So if you, it is exactly on the right side. We've been there, but you know, seven years ago. So can you possibly locate and show us the mosque of Omar, please? Um, so let's see if Google Street View will take us to there. It is um, absolutely on the right as we face the church. You know, I know where it is. <laughs> I know where it is. It's the question is, will Google Street View allow me to take us to there? So let's yeah, if we'll it, try. If possible, if possible. We'll tr but we'll, I wanted we'll... to make that comment. Um, yeah, that was thank historic. You. Welcome. Thank you. And um, thank you for making that comment. I will point to you where he prayed and where the mosque was built. Super. But then you'll say, wait a minute. Does it make sense <laughs> that, he, that he prayed over there? Hold on. So, but since we have maps in that, so let's point to that. I, I, I hope that with Google Street, we'll be able to talk to it because it's right up, the, right up the steps from the church of the, of the Holy Sepulchre. Thank you for pointing that out. What's your name though? I missed it at the beginning. Chaudhry. Chaudhry is my first name. Last name is Sadiq. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about Omar and Sophronius, um, the archbishop who took him around and right. showed him different sites. We're just jumping a little bit ahead of ourselves because there's Christianity and Islam. And this is that what you mentioned is that connecting point between the two of them. So Indeed. let's share screen once again. And, you know, let's go land um, at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre now. And in order to do that, let's leave the Western Wall. And what we're going to do is... Here we go. Let's go for a ride. <laughs> and um, I mean, just so you know, I did get Gail to look at um, uh, the woman that was asking about cl closed captioning to watch it on her phone. I told her on her phone it should it closed captions it, but she said it's still going um, a little fast. And I, I know I know the conversation is is fast moving, but if we could slow it's just a little sure. bit. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, let's start. Um, by talking about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, at the end, you made the comment about um, Omar ibn Khattab and Sophronius meeting together and offering him to pray in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. When I'm done talking about the church and I move over to Haram al-Sharif and Al-Aqsa and Dome of the Rock, if you see I'm forgetting to talk about it, please jump in and remind me because that will fit the stories together very nicely. Okay, sure. if you see. Anyway, okay, so now we are landing. We're going to jump forward in time, okay? Um, Jesus is going to walk around Jerusalem, the time of the first century, uh, the beginning of the first century. The second time was, is going to be destroyed in the year 70 um, of the Common Era. Um, and it, at that point, we already have the first Christians in Jerusalem, but they are going to be persecuted by the Roman Empire and will only be in the fourth century called the Byzantine Era. Um, that Constantine will bring about that Christianity will be accepted by the Romans as the official religion of the Roman Empire. And they're going to build a massive church that's going to be the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that does not look like what we're looking at right now. But this is the entrance to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre today. So let's just get a bit of a feel and twist and turn. Usually we'll walk in from this entrance. I'm over here and I I'm waiting for the day where it is jam-packed with tourists again. I was, I've from, been to the church two or three times since the beginning of COVID, including a couple of weeks ago. On one hand, it's wonderful that it's empty because you can walk around and not be crushed by other people. But on the other hand, it's extremely depressing because there's nobody here. Usually it is so full that you can barely move. Or we come from this direction over here. This is the direction of the Mosque of Omar. We'll talk about it at the end. Well, let's talk about that. But wait, that's the wrong direction. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, as, we're, as we land and we stand over here and we're looking at the entrance to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, when I'm saying that this is not what it looked like at the beginning, what did it, yes, look like at the beginning when Constantine and his mother Helena are going to build it? To, go, to answer that question, let's go back to our PowerPoint over here and let's take a look at this picture over here. What we're looking at over here is basically this is what the Church of the Holy Sepulchre looked like from when it was inaugurated in the year 335 of the Common Era until parts of it were destroyed several hundred years later at the beginning of the 11th century. Um, in, at the beginning of the 11th century, when um, uh, what happens is, is the, especially the area of the Royal Basilica are going to be destroyed by an Egyptian caliph called El Hakim. Um, the Romans, okay, what they're going to do, apparently, in the site where Jesus was crucified, 
And Jesus is going to be crucified and buried in general in this area over here. I'm going to slowly build it up. So just sort of go with the flow with me over here. Um, the Romans are going to build a temple for the goddess Aphrodite in order to try and erase history and what happened over there. What happens is the reverse. Because they're trying to erase what happened, people actually remember what happened because the altar was located over there. So in the fourth century rolls around, this church is going to be built like this over here. Now, people would walk in from the eastern side over here. You'd make your way into the basilica over here. All right, classic church. And after coming out of the western side of the basilica area, you have this open area over here. And it's in this open area over here that you're going to have the Golgotha, all right, the place where Jesus was crucified. And we're going to be visiting that soon enough when we actually go into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But if it's there, the Golgotha Hill of Calvary, where he is going to be crucified, it's inside this round structure called the Rotunda that he's going to be buried and then come back to life three days later. And that's what you'll see. 700 years after the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is built, El Hakam, the Egyptian Muslim Caliph, is going to destroy this basilica um, over here. And only this area of the rotunda is going to remain. Now, there will be different stages of rebuilding it over and over again. But what's going to happen at the end of the day is, is when the crusaders are going to arrive in Jerusalem 900 years ago, and the year 1099, and when they celebrate their jubilee in the year 1149, meaning, what is that, about 850 years ago? You don't need to remember the years. Okay, I'm just saying them to sort of give things context over here. Right At that point, um, the version, if you want to call it version 2.0, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre will exist as we know it today. When we look at this church today, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, this version of it is the Crusader version dating back to roughly 800 plus years ago. At that point, the area of the Rotunda, okay, which is inside over here, along with the Golgotha, which had been separated from it originally, are all going to be inside this building over here. And this is what we're about to go visit right now, okay? I want you to please remember these two entrances, okay, these doors over here, one and two, because we're going to get back to it in a little bit. And now let us make our way into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, into this entrance over here. Um, unfortunately, Google Earth Street View does not do that. So I ended up actually getting a good movie off of YouTube. I walked through myself making a video, but I do the best job. So I had someone do a much, someone else did a much better job than me. Um, but you know what? We will start. I take it back. We're going to start with the video that I created inside. And then um, we are going to go to a different video that I'm using. When we go inside, it's important to remember the term the Via Dolorosa the way of the cross. Because before we go inside, what is important to know is that running through both the Muslim and Christian quarters, we have the Via Dolorosa, the way of the sorrow. The Via Dolorosa is what is traditionally, okay, the last, Jesus's last journey, last walk with the crucifix, with the cross on him, to when the end he was crucified. There are 14 different stations, each one telling a different story. Nine of the stations, are along the route to the Church of Holy Sepulchre. The last five stations are actually inside the church. We will be visiting these last five stations, stations 10 through 14, inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, so what we're looking at over here, this, this is a video that I created, so a little jumpy and I apologize, is we're actually looking, let's activate this, um, we're standing inside this room over here. We can see a mosaic of Jesus from 900 years ago on top. And now when we turn to this window over here on the right, what is beyond this window, and I know this isn't the best view, there's a, a, a room, okay, um, that belongs to the Catholics, to the Franciscans, which is the tent station where Jesus' clothes were taken off from him. Okay, that'll be inside this room over here, right inside over there. This is the tent station where Jesus is, Clothes will be taken from him. Now, when we, where did my little video go to? Just a second, it disappeared. Here we go. If we continue turning, we'll look at this. We're doing sort of did a 360 over here. We're making our way. We walk past the 11th station. And now what we're going to do is, is I want to, oh, this is giving me a hard time. I want to come to over here. No, sorry about that. We're moving a little bit forward. And I want to pause it for a second. 
This is the 11th station. It's not so clear where Jesus is going to be put on the cross. And now we're going to go to the next room. And the next room is going to be the room of the Golgotha or the hill of Calvary. And as we look right over here, and I'm going to stop. I know it's not the best picture. I'll go to a better one in a minute. This is the hill of Calvary. This is the Golgotha. And now let's go forward to this picture, which is much better. This will be the 12th and 13th stations where Jesus is going to be crucified. We can see the actual bedrock over here. Take a look. Okay, beyond this window on the right side and on the left side, we see the actual bedrock where Jesus was crucified, the 12th station, and his mother standing on the right over here, the 13th station, 13th station looking at him. We'll now jump forward. We'll come down from the steps, and we're going to actually come back to the entrance area of the church. And what we can see over here is the stone of unction. When you walk into the church, a lot of times people will sort of be sitting and rubbing and feeling the stone of unction over here. This is where, according to tradition, Jesus was, he, they lied him down after he was crucified um, on the hill of Calvary, on the Golgotha, his body was taken, he was put on the stone over here, anointed in oil. And then from there, we're going to walk to the Edicola. We're going to walk to the last station. We're going to walk to the 14th station. And it's going to be in the 14th station that we're going to be able to see um, where Jesus was buried and comes back to life three days later. We can see this square structure that was built in 1808 by the Russian, by the Russian Orthodox. The Greek Orthodox are in charge of it today. The video is twisting a little bit, and we can take a look up to the top. We can also see the round rotunda, the roof that's on top over here. It's a new one that was built in the 1990s because of several fires that took place over there over the years. They had to fix it. And now what we're going to do is we're going to walk right to the entrance um, of the edicula. And as we make our way to the entrance of the edicula over here, we will be able to see uh, just the entrance. We're not going to walk in um, the entrance to two rooms. Here, let's let the video twist and turn. I have to say it's so much easier to guide this for real. <laughs> I'm doing virtuals for a year and a half. Easier to do it for real. Um, but what we'll have, we're going to have two rooms inside. We're going to have the chamber of the angel and Jesus's tomb. Um, because what will happen over here is, is Jesus is going to be buried. And after he's buried, um, three days later, um, his mother, Mary, and his friend, Mary of Magdalene, are going to come to here. And what they're going to see is, is that the grave is open and angels are going to tell them that Jesus has come back um, to life after which he will walk around uh, for the next 40 days before going up to the heavens once again if we would go inside today we'd see a stone slab from fit the from the 1500s from 500 years ago there were archaeological excavations that took place over here a few hundred um uh, a few years ago and they went down they found stone slabs from earlier eras from the crusader and then byzantine era 1700 years ago and underneath that they found a barrel cave era er, area in general this whole area um has burial caves from the second temple era from 2000 years ago not to mention that we don't know for sure, but it is very possible that this whole area where the Church of the Sepulchre is today, 2,000 years ago, was outside the walls of the Old City. Yes, today in 2021, we're inside the walls of the Old City, but back then we were outside the walls of Jerusalem, which would also work because you wouldn't crucify and bury people inside of the walls of Jerusalem at that time. So geographically, it works well with where he was buried um, historically. But let's continue along uh, and let's also soon enough start putting the different religions together because now I skipped forward and now we're going to walk to under the area of the Golgotha of where Jesus was crucified. We see this bedrock over here. Okay, that's part of the bedrock of where above we were above before where he was crucified. Let's walk past it. And now we're going to walk into a little room that is called the Chapel of Adam. And here we go um, inside. Okay, and we're going to turn and let's uh, let's like stop right right over here. Now, we can spend also hours in the Church of the Sepulchre. The place is massive and it's complex. And of course, I have very limited time to be in here. And which means I should probably have a good reason to stop in this very simple little chapel over here. And this is it. this is a story to try and put the religions together. I want to go back for a minute to the Temple Mount. Okay, the Temple, the Temple. Um, several, a few hundred years before the Church of the Sepulchre, and then we're going to bring it back to the church. Um, sorry. We started this virtual tour by saying that 
according to Jewish tradition, the hill that's underneath the Temple Mount called Mount Moriah is the place of creation. It's the center of the world. Maybe also according to tradition, the place of the Garden of Eden and Adam, the first man was born and buried over there according to traditions. Now, let's leave the Temple Mount and let's come into the area of the Golgotha and the Church of the Sepulchre and to where we're standing right now. We're now standing underneath the Golgotha. It's above our heads, okay? Above our heads, there was um, a, a crucifix. That, that's where Jesus was crucified. Okay, when he was crucified, his blood will come down to within the bedrock. And, and according to the New Testament, it will touch upon the skull of Adam, who, according to tradition, will be buried over here and will bring Adam back to life. We're back to this whole idea of Adam being buried over here, death and coming back to life once again. In the Jewish temple, okay, there were sacrifices that were brought. We're now in the church of the sepulchre. This is a sacrifice, okay? Um, we're talking about in the temple, there was a sacrifice for Passover that was brought. Jesus was crucified on Passover. This is, all right, um, sort of like a, 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 a crucifixion over here for repentance and Adam who brought the first sin to the world who will die and be, will come back to life as a result of this crucifixion is also located over here in a place that is believed to be the center of the world. Many of these themes from the temple the Jewish temple were brought over here to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And if we go back now for a minute once again, and I did that on purpose, to the entrance of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I want you to take a look at, oh, let's make this big again. There we go. I want us to take a look at these doors, okay? These doors are similar to the doors that we used to walk through to go into the temple, 2,000 years ago. Remember I said, pay attention to them that I was pointing to before. And it's similar to the doors of the Gates of Mercy or the Golden Gate. It has different names that are going to the Temple Mount or Haram al-Sharif of today. This is basically taking a holy spot in the Temple Mount and bringing it to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is what I'm talking about. Three, three religions, not side by side, but one on top of the other. And we're going to do the same thing when we talk about Islam in a moment on Haram al-Sharif. Now, somebody asked me, a little a while ago regarding um, the mosque of Omar and Omar coming to pray over here at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So yes, uh, um, Omar will come to pray at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Omar ibn Hattab in year 638 of the Common Era will lead the Muslim conquest of Jerusalem at the time. And he's going to meet the Archbishop Sophronius, who is going to lead him to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and tell him to pray. Now, where are they going to walk in from back then? They're going to walk in from the eastern side over here but Omar Ibn Hattab system I'm not going to pray inside the church so he prays outside which would make sense that he probably prayed over here today's mosque which was built a few hundred years later we're talking about in the 11th century stands more like over here but it tells us it tells us a story it tells us a story of the event and let's see if Google Earth will take us to over there I did not check before but let's see because to go to the mosque of Omar we need to turn left and we need to go up these steps over here and very dangerous to go walk along with Google Earth before you've actually, for real, with other people before you've practiced it at home. You never know where you're going to end up. I apologize. We, can we see it? Yes, we can. Here we go. Here's the minaret from the Mosque of Omar. I'm sorry, Google Earth will not take us up these steps, at least from this angle, because the entrance is right beyond the store over here. But here is the mosque, the minaret from the Mosque of Omar. Thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate it. And that will leapfrog us up to Haram El Sharif. Here we go. Thank and you for doing your best job with that. My pleasure. And now. Um, oh, and sorry, is it okay to, to jump in? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and that's a beautiful um, uh, story that you connected. Uh, and the reason that um, uh, uh, Omar did not pray inside the church was because he said he didn't want people after him to try and destroy it. So he was said purposely I'm gonna pray a little bit separately and that way they will the mass separately so he, he didn't want anybody to like uh, say oh somebody you know religious or something had prayed over here we've got to destroy it so that's uh that's the connection of why he prayed separately thank you very much um in the fourth century Omar ibn Hattab and the Muslims are going to conquer Jerusalem now the Quran will tell us in the 17th surah Okay, it'll tell us the story of Muhammad, who is going to go on his night journey, okay, um, on El Burak, which um, had the body of a horse, the face of a beautiful woman, a diamond studded neck, um, and the beautiful tail of a peacock, 
and they will come to El Aqsa, to the place at the edge. Okay, which is why um, this entire structure is also known as El Aqsa. We have the El Aqsa Mosque, but the whole massive compound of Haram al Sharif is also known as El Aqsa. Now, when Muhammad is going to arrive over here, um, in cut out for one second, just to interrupt you, you, just, you said this massive structure, and then it cut out for one second. Okay. Oh, I forgot what it was. Oh, I was wanting to hear it. I'm sorry. I just wanted to let you know. Okay, I'm sorry. I hope uh, it's okay. All right. Uh, oh, okay. Um, if you remember anything that you might have missed or something doesn't make sense, please stop me. Okay. Anyway, um, El Burak will be tied to a wall on the side, maybe the western, we don't know. And then what's going to happen is Muhammad is going to come up to the stone that is underneath the Dome of the Rock today. He's going to come up to the foundation stone that we can see a picture of right over here. And from this stone, he's going to step up. And what he's going to do, he's going to go through seven spheres of heaven. And he's going to go up a golden ladder with silver um, ledges on it. And as he's making his web, he's going to meet different previous prophets, Abraham, okay, um, Moses, and Jesus. And when he gets to the top, he's going to receive the Quran from Allah, from God, in which Allah will tell Muhammad that you need to pray 50 times a day. And Moses will sort of tell Allah, you know, that, excuse me, tell Muhammad that you can go back and ask for a lesser amount because 50 is a lot until they get to five prayers during the day. And with that, Muhammad is going to come down um, from the heavens. Now, when Omar ibn Hattab is going to arrive over here with his army uh, several years later and conquer Jerusalem, he's going to come up to, I'm going to now use the term, when I'm in Judaism, we use the, we use the term the temple, not from the temple. In Islam, we use um, the full term is El Haram El Kadsi Ash Sharif, the holy Jerusalem and respectable or elevated. Haram El Sharif. And he's going to come to you and he's going to be walking with the man whose name is Omar Kab El Akbar, um, who was a Jew who actually converted to Islam. Because he'd been previously been Jewish, Omar Ibn Hattab says to him, I want you to show me where this foundation stone is, where the Jewish temple used to stand. And it was simply covered with a lot, a lot, a lot of garbage. And they cleared it out and they found it. At which point Omar Ibn, and it's located, of course, underneath the Dome of the Rock of today. Omar ibn Hattab will build the first mosque on top of Haram al-Sharif and will be located over here where today's Al-Aqsa Mosque is. It's not the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It was built more or less where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is today. And later, these two beautiful structures that we can see today, the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque will be built by the two um, Umay Muslim leaders by the name of Abd al-Malik and Abd al-Walid. Um, in the Dome of the Rock will be built in the year 691 of the Common Era in the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the year 705 um, of the Common Era. And these are the structures that we're looking at over here. The Dome of the Rock over the years has pretty much remained the same structure. When you go much closer to it, I'll talk about what's changed, but the actual essence of the structure has remained the same. Not so the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The reason is because it's simply um, geographical or topography. The Dome of the Rock is literally sitting on Mount Moriah. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is sitting on landfill. King Herod filled up a lot of this area in order to build this massive, massive structure that we see over here. The whole southern end is all filled up with arches and landfill. Now, um, Israel is sitting on a, a tecta on, on next to a massive um, um, rift, and there's earthquakes here on average every 100 years. So the southern area has simply been destroyed partially many times over. So the Al-Aqsa uh, Al Mosque has been built up over the years. The Al-Aqsa Mosque that we're looking at over here today from above is a structure that dates back Today, most of it, notice it's a little eclectic, the architecture, but most of it from the time of about the 11th century, okay, when there's Muslim rule over here, and then later after the Crusader rule, we have Salah Hadin the Ayubi coming to over here about 800 years ago, 800, 1,000 plus years ago, is from when the, most of what we see today in the Al-Aqsa Mosque um, is going to exist. Let us jump over here back into Google. Uh, 360, and here we're now standing next to the Dome of the Rock. I'm sorry, there was no Google Street View on the Temple Mount, Haram and Sharif, so I have to use this over here. When we're looking at the Dome of the Rock that is over here, let's just do a quick 360 uh, to get a feel of really where we are. We're twisting around, and here we go. So I said the structure 
its original from 1,300 years ago, but its covering has been fixed up many times. The main thing that we'll see, especially from far and sticks out, is the Golden Dome. This is the latest version of the gold that was put on it. It was put on by King Hussein um, from Jordan back in 1994. 150 kilo, that's over 300 pounds of gold. It coated the dome over here, and that's what we're looking at today. We can, of course, also see these beautiful blue ceramics running all the way around. They were originally put by um, in the Turkish Sultan Suleiman the Great. We're talking about the 16th century, 500 years ago. Most of it fixed up over the years, and we can see the passages from the Quran running along the top over here, telling us the story of Muhammad's famous night journey to over here. But if we actually go inside, as we can do over here, in just a second, I need a drink. Excuse me one second. Um, we can twist a bit just to get a feel of where we are. And we're looking at the foundation stone um, that is over here. And it's believed that in the days to come, or in the days of judgment, this foundation stone over here, all right, um, um, which came from heaven, okay, according to Islam, and landed over here, will connect to the stone of the Kaaba. And it's over here that the day of judgment will take place with Muhammad as people make their way from the Mount of Olives that is east of Haram al-Sharif over um, the massive valley, the Kiron Valley that's over there, onto Haram al-Sharif um, that's over here. Also underneath um, the foundation stone over here, if you go down steps, you can actually make your way to underneath the stone. And underneath it, we can see the Mahab, the praying areas um, that are dedicated to David, and Solomon, Elijah the prophet, and um, Gabriel the angel, all over here. It's amazing because these prophets over here are holy. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all connecting together over here. And if we run down a little bit more, I want to pop over to one more picture, to this one over here. We're now standing in between the Dome of the Rock on one side and the Al-Aqsa Mosque over here on the other side. Okay, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, by the way, is a massive mosque. It has 15, one five, 15 aisles, okay, with seven walls separating them for prayer. You can fit 5,000 people inside to pray. But what's in the middle, and this is very symbolic, this is what's called the El Kas, okay, the big cup. Um, and this is the place where you come to wash your hands and your feet when you're making your way for prayer, okay? The, by the way, the Dome of the Rock is more of a shrine or a place, place of personal prayer. But the massive prayer, the Friday prayers together, will take place in the Al-Aqsa Mosque. If it's everybody's too packed and it's too full, then women will pray inside the Dome of the Rock, and the men will continue praying around the area of um, Haram al-Sharif and inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque over here. But what is what is El Qasri? What does it stand for? It says that you wash your hands and your feet over here. We think about it um, maybe a little bit more in depth, as I'd like to say. Let's go back to the story of Abraham, who's a fam famous, he's very famous, who's a holy prophet and person to all three religions. The description in the book of Bereshit of Genesis is, is that when Abraham would be sitting at the entrance of his tent and people would be coming from the outside, from desert or desolate areas, which are dangerous, okay? Not only are you covered in dust, you're also fearful outside. And Abraham would accept them. He'd wa the, the description of the passages in the Old Testament are he'd wash their hands and their feet as they're making their way into his house, also so that they're clean, but also he's telling them, I'm now protecting you. Islam will also come out of the area of the desert. You're walking around the desert. It can be a scary place. It can be a place where, you know, you're fighting one another. But over here, you are making your way into someone's home, okay? You are washing your hands and your feet to a place that is protected. And here, too, you're coming from the outside, the day, daily life, you know, the pressures of daily life. You're washing your hands and feet, symbolically washing away the pressures of daily life. And you're walking either into the Dome of the Rock or into the Al-Aqsa Mosque where you're protected, a place of prayer um, and more um, tranquility. So let's go back now to the PowerPoint and put a lot of these things together before we finish um, and open it up to some more questions if you have. When we're taking a bird's eye view of Haram al-Sharif today, let's take a look, all right? Oops, didn't mean to do that. This is what I want. Um, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, okay, is built in the shape of a basilica. And you might be saying, wait a minute, Ami. I know that from somewhere. A minute ago, you showed me the basilica of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Okay, this over here is a basilica structure because an Omar ibn Khattab is going to 
arrive over here in the seventh century, what builders is he going to use? He's going to use um, the local workers, all right? And they're, they're Byzantines. They're, you know, they, they know what they know, and they'll build a basilica-shaped structure, all right? And that's what this is built like over here. But what's coming going on the northern side beyond the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Dome of the Rock? What's underneath the Dome of the Rock? You have the foundations on a huge rock. From over there, Muhammad will go up to the heavens, okay? Then come down, he's going to go up to the heavens. So we have a basilica structure, and separated from it, beyond it, a stone where Muhammad goes up to the heavens. This is sounding very familiar because that is the same story as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. We have the basilica structure over here, okay, where you pray. And then beyond that, separated from it, you have this dome structure, just like the Dome of the Rock, where you have the stone, where Jesus from there will go up to the heavens, all right? He will, anyway... This is, and not only that, if we put all this together, we're back again. Here we go. We're back again at the Haram al-Sharif or the Temple Mount. If we go to the Jewish traditions where the first and temples used to stand right over here, the center of the world, okay, everything will be connecting together. So I started at the beginning by saying that in Jerusalem, we have the three monotheistic religions, not side by side, but one on top of the other with all these connections which in my opinion is one of the more beautiful things um, to see. Now, um, I did something a little bit not fair, and that is I shoved into an hour and 15 minutes what we could have spent a couple days <laughs> either talking about or touring around. So I'm sure there are a lot of things you might be thinking, how did he not say this? How did he mention this in one second? Well, I did my best. Um, and um, at this point, I'll stop. And if you have any questions... I am in your hands. Thank you so very much. I appreciate this a lot. Um, one of the questions that Shayla was asking earlier when we were in the church was, who opens this church now? Excellent question. There are two Muslim families called the, Ju Ju um, the Judah and the Nusaiba families. Okay. Then they are Muslim families that will open the church every day, going all the way back to the time of Salah Din the Ayubi, who's going to conquer Jerusalem from the Crusaders in the year 1187, 800 years ago. He will give the keys to the Nusaiba family, and later the Judah family will also get permission. And what you do is, excuse me, every morning at like 5 a.m., they'll come from the outside, they'll knock on the door, okay? One of the priests on the inside will open a little shaft door, uh, like a little window from the inside, they will send a ladder out. You can see this ladder, by the way, when you go into the church. And then the representative that morning will climb the ladder. They'll take a key. He'll unlock the door, the same key that's 800 years old. And that's how they lock, they open the door in the morning. It's also how they lock it at night. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, I will say I appreciate how you set it up for us because I think sometimes when we see stuff now, we have a hard time. Um, we have to go back to where where it was before um back back how the structures were before because when you were saying this is where jesus was was crucified this is where jesus was buried i in my mind i'm thinking this was like far away you know and then there's all the structure around it right and it's important to get like that that structure wasn't there that structure is you know, right. newer, yeah you know could be in the past 800 years it was erected for some it was quite interesting to see like that this is where these things i remember when i when i went to the first before it was interesting to see that that's where yeah, hold on one second someone has the the background yeah, it's me, very difficult me, um uh, i got it i got it i'm trying to figure out who i'm um joan said very interesting presentation thanks so very much um pleasure thank you um taiba said wow fascinating connection back to what you were saying about the center of the world so many prophets rising to heaven from this beautiful earth thank you so much pleasure and thank you jeffrey was asking wonderful presentation thank you how may we get information about ami's company i don't know if you want ah, to put anything in the chat yes usually i have a whole thing with my email and my website and whatnot and this time i just didn't i didn't connect it to the presentation so i will write both my email and my website i appreciate you asking thank you very much so oops do we have um, anybody else on here that would like to? Um, yeah, it just took me such for such a whirlwind. I had to have them bring me a cup of coffee. <laughs> it's like, oh, here's my door. website. Um, anybody have a question? 
or, or thoughts? I know you can't see it, but I'm looking right at you, MB. Yeah, just a comment. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you, MB, very much. This this was well organized. I, I surely do appreciate it. And thank Christina, thank you for putting it together. This is an opportunity that we, we have not had before. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. I hope you thank enjoyed you. everything that you saw. I know I certainly did. Well, it's, uh, it's always great for me to run virtual tours because it gives me the opportunity to do what I love doing, which I really have not been able to do outside for the last year and a half. And um, so thank you very much for giving, uh, giving me this opportunity. Toda. Yeah. As we say in Hebrew, thank you. Yes. So tell us for a second, then, then look, we can go ahead and go. How has this, how, we, know, we know what COVID has been like here. I mean, if we right. could just ask just for, uh, you know, if we're on, if we're talking to the other side of the world at the moment, how has COVID been there with all of the yeah. quarantine restrictions and different things like that? So, of course, you've gone through a roller coaster, just like any country in the world. Um, we have been through three quarantines, um, each one different levels of, you know, how strict they were. The first one was extremely strict and the other ones are a little bit more relaxed. Um, but the economy was shut down three times, sometimes completely, sometimes less completely. Um, but since the vaccinations arrived in Israel, and I understand Israel has been sort of like the test country for the whole world because we're a small, a very small population, uh, only over 9 million people. And we were able to re receive the Pfizer um, 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 vaccines very early. And um, I think we started giving them out uh, sometime back in the winter. And um, at this point, 66% of the population have been vaccinated. So in essence, as of a couple months ago, we thought we were almost past it. Um, and basically everything, everything, everything opened up with the exception of um, a tourist, non-citizens being able to come to Israel. Um, that, I mean, that, that was it. So pretty much everything was open and that was the only drawback. Um, but the Delta strain uh, from India, this new strain that is starting to drive the world crazy has come back to over here again. And as a result of that, a lot of kids who haven't been vaccinated yet, only now we're vaccinating the 12 to 15 year old kids. Um, a lot of kids are, are getting sick. Um, and people also, there's a certain percentage, a small percent, but a certain percentage of people who have been vaccinated who are also getting sick. So because that after everything was opened up and no one needed any masks anymore and everything was good, um, they are bringing the masks back and you hear about more and more people going into quarantine now. So we haven't gone back as a uh, society into quarantine before, like literally we were all quarantined. You couldn't leave your home. You couldn't leave nothing. Um, at all the stores were closed. Everything was closed. Now everything is still open. Um, but more and more people are going to quarantine and we need to walk around with masks inside and soon we're going to need to probably walk around with masks outside. And um, the government is trying very much to keep it under control um, and encourage more and more kids now to get vaccinated because you can get vaccinated age 12 to 15. And they're even looking into vaccinate eight to 12 year old kids to try and keep it under control once again. So um, that's really where we're at. Uh, right now. Um, thank you for that update. I, mean, I, I was just very curious. I think a lot of us here experienced a, a milder quarantine. I know I have friends that are missionaries in Honduras and they were only allowed, uh, depending on their, their address or their card number, certain days, one person from the family was allowed to go out to go to the store to go get food and that was it. Yeah. You know, there yeah. was, and I, I just, I know here we didn't have, have that at all. I mean, we could go to the store yeah, just stay in, stay indoors. And, it, you know, I think city to city was different. I'm in a smaller town. Some of the bigger cities might have been a little bit more stringent, but they were they were they were they were strict over here. I mean, the first quarantine, yeah. you weren't allowed to go more than 100 meters from your home. You're allowed to go to buy in shops. But that was it. The second quarantine was a little bit more relaxed and the third quarantine. No. So in general, you weren't supposed to go from city to city. First quarantine, it really was the highways were empty. By the third quarantine, people didn't really stick to it anymore. So, uh, right, right. Sort of what yeah. happened. I know it's it's been different in every country, and so it's just been interesting yeah. to hear about what it's like. Um, I don't think your information went into the chat. Um, oh, wait a second. Who did I send it to? I sent it to. Did you send it to one of? Oh, I sent it to Linda. Whoops. Okay, I don't know why that happened. Let me send okay. it to to everybody. Sorry about that. Uh, everyone, here we go. 
once again, my email, Ami Braun at gmail.com. I should have gotten it. And my website, Ami Israel Guide. And I've only just started seeing some things about the Delta strain coming up. I've heard in South Africa that they're dealing with it. And then I guess if they're dealing with it there. Yeah, it's 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 unfortunately been hitting hard. The Achilles tendon of any country, I think, but of course, also Israel is the airport. Um, and unfortunately, right. people who Israelis who left and came back and they, they came back with it. Um, so it's 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 unfortunate. We were like down to zero almost. And now it's it's starting to go up. Right. Well, I hope, hope hopefully there will be an end to all of this at some point. If you would like to um, anybody, I guess we don't have any other questions. Um, I'm going to just remove our spotlights here and go back to a normal grid. Um, you gallery view should be um i just would like to say thank you all to all of you that joined us if you'd like to unmute yourself um and thank ami or say no, good, no, thank good you. afternoon or anything you can um thank you so and then much. We'll, then we'll go ahead and wrap up our event because um stop live stream and stop recording